CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara communities through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2022 to help keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400 and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. Welcome to a March Madness edition of Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with my usual co-host, Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. And we are joined by two guests, which is a rarity on Tim Graham and Friends, not because I don't have friends, but we just usually have a maximum of three. But this is March Madness. And we have with us Damon Wildcats men's basketball coach, Mike McDonald, who, of course, is going to help us with our brackets here. And this is a must listen. You're going to have to uh, hear the analysis uh, from Mike McDonald uh, before you uh, fill out uh, your bracket if you want a chance to win. And longtime friend of the show, former co-host, Mike Rodak, uh, who is covering the top team in the field. Number one seed in the South region and believed to be, uh, if you're ranking all the teams, uh, uh, right? And don't they say they're the best team in the field? Yeah, number one overall. Uh, so uh, the uh, Alabama Crimson Tide, a uh, couple of storylines going on there with uh, former UB coach uh, Nate Oates' team. Uh, but uh, our guest of honor is Mike McDonald. And uh, Mike, uh, hell of a season. You went 20 and eight. Your record was actually better than last year. But as you were saying before we came on, um, disappointing. You didn't make the NCAA tournament. So to go 20 and eight and be a little depressed uh, is probably not the worst place to be uh, as a college coach. It doesn't make me feel any better right now, Tim. But yes, I know. <laughs> I know what you're saying. Um, and, uh, you know, you, we had a good season with a lot of young guys and a a good group coming back next year. So uh, we'll take it and we'll build on it, hopefully. How much more difficult is it to make the tournament? Um, because your loss to St. Thomas Aquinas ended an eight-game win streak and you'd, you'd won 15 out of 16. But to get into the, to get into the tournament, to not get into the tournament, can you at least explain – the difficulty of that, because if you to look at your resume for people who follow division one college basketball and to see where you are, you would, you would say, well, of course, Damon is in the field. Yep. Well, and what division two men have gone to a model, a little like division one men that they don't count necessarily whether you're hot, they want to look at the whole body of work. You're right. From January 1st on, we were 14 and two. We beat three top 10 teams in the East region. I mean, we had been the two losses were both on the road, both were close. You look at it and say, all right, this team deserves to be in the NCAA tournament. And it's not like we were terrible before January 1st. Uh, the spot it came down to was a team that had a little Dominican college, had a little bit better uh, RPI, had a little bit better of the computer numbers, which, you know, again, you look at it and you say, does that matter? You know, we, the eye test to me, and I'm biased, uh, had Damon in there. But, uh, you know, went to the national committee and they look at it and we lost out on, on the vote. And that's what happens sometimes. I mean, it, it's not only who you play, it's who your opponents play, it's who's in your league that can affect it. And uh, their league was ranked a little bit higher than ours and that that ended up working against us. Still a hell of a season nonetheless. Um, I guess... What what are you doing now? Because uh, in terms of recruiting or looking at next season, uh, are you reviewing? I mean, what what's the what's Mike McDonald's day um, other than maybe a, a nap in the afternoon? <laughs> a random podcast here and there. <laughs> yes. Well, that I mean, look, this has to be the highlight. This isn't random. Don't take that wrong. <laughs> 
But what, what, what are you doing now? What's, what's up? Uh, with your now program? it's kind of picking up the pieces right after the season. So we, uh, we will meet with our staff tomorrow. We'll go over each guy individually, work, talk about things that we think we need to uh, develop and, uh, and get better at. And then we will, uh, we'll meet with our guys eventually. They're on spring break right now. So when they come back, we'll meet with them individually and say, you know, this is who we have, this is who we see you, this is where what you have to do to get better. This is what we have to do to improve upon to be a postseason team. And uh, then we'll start workouts. We can do workouts all the way up until a week before classes then, which will be um, uh, May or April uh, 27th, I think, is when our last day of workouts are. And then, you know, also trying to figure out schedule for next year and figure out um, recruiting and finalize recruiting. We don't lose a lot of guys, so we don't necessarily want to bring in a lot of guys, but uh, we want to make sure we bring in the right guys who can help us uh, and help our foundation going forward. Mike, you mentioned bringing back most of your team, and I think a lot of the guys that, that played a lot of the minutes for you, but how cognizant are you of the transfer portal and the accelerated recruiting calendar that that's created? And if it's not affecting you, how do you think it's affecting your coaching peers and everybody? How many players are on the market this early in March? Jonah affects everybody at, at, if you're playing in college at every level. I've heard of Division three programs that have eight guys in the transfer portal. Uh, I've heard, I think the number yesterday was over 200 kids went in the portal yesterday from random places. We've been fortunate. Now, we might, we're might we going to have individual meetings, and some guys might say, I'm not going to come back. I think we anticipate a majority of our guys who've played a majority of the minutes will be back. And we also have red shirts who sat out who will add to the mix too. Um, but I, I think everybody is aware of the portal because you see teams, teams that we play, teams that are in our league. Heck, the kid who won conference player of the year in our league the day it was announced he was player of the year, he went in the transfer portal. And, uh, you know, I don't know if timing was good there, but that's the way it works nowadays. And uh, everybody wants to get in there so that maybe some school will jump at them and take them early before somebody else comes in. I think you see a lot of right now Division two and lower level Division one players in because their seasons have ended. And there are guys who are in the tournament that once their season ends, boom, they're going to hit the portal. What was it like a couple of years back? You open that portal and you see your own son's name in there. <laughs> I knew that was coming. So it was, uh, we were prepared for it and it wasn't uh, a big deal. And he already knew where he was going. So it wasn't like uh, it, it was, uh, it was any kind of surprise. It was just more of a, something you had to do procedurally to, uh, so he could transfer. And I could talk to him and then pay him. I still have to pay him, <laughs> even though he, yeah, I still have to feed him even though there it was, it wasn't part of his NIL deal. So you could have it, talked to him otherwise? No, I could. <laughs> <laughs> Not during quiet period. Yeah. <laughs> and what are the rules on that? I mean, is there, do, are there rules you have to adhere to? As for our as coaching my son, Nick. Yeah. Um, I mean, he still has the same rules as far as, uh, you know, when he can work out and things like that. But, uh, no, it's a, it's a lot. I mean, it's not like I can't give him money if he needs money for gas, right? Uh, there's that that all goes by the wayside a little bit. And the way it is now, the NCAA has opened everything up, so everybody's getting paid. So now, you know, if, if probably 10, 15 years ago, you'd have to be a little bit more careful, but not really. If it's your son, it's a little different thing. I don't know if this is uh, squeezing a – square peg in a round hole by making this transition. But uh, Mike Rodak goes down to Alabama to cover the Crimson Tide right before Nate Oates took the job, right? He wasn't the coach yet. So just coincidental. All the way around. But yeah. Okay. All right. So he's down there. And I think a lot of people looked at that situation as tall task. It's a football school. But with NIL, with transfer portals, and it was kind of a sweet spot at that time. And I think people didn't quite know what the lay of the land was going to be when you're turning back the clock to that time when Nate Oates became uh, Alabama's coach. Um, I wonder, Mike, in covering it, Mike Rodak, um, 
the speed of this in which this has happened, how how has how has Alabama and the 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 region digested this this phenomenon? And also from a national standpoint, how do you think headlines headlines aside, uh, Alabama's trans transition has um, has changed maybe the way all the entire country takes a look at how to build a program? Yeah, well, two good questions, obviously different answers. I think, you know, for how fans have taken it, like nobody really cared about basketball when I got here. There's definitely a small group of like diehard Alabama basketball fans. But outside of that, the general public, you know, you walk around the supermarket, ask them about Alabama basketball, they probably couldn't have named a player four years ago when he got here. Um, so I was even like taking cell phone pictures from my stories of, of the games and there was no AP photos or anything. And it just felt really small timey. Um, but then, you know, the combination of their success on the court, plus the attention that the Brandon Miller situation has brought. Now it's like every single day, it feels like there's a national story written about them. New York times, Washington post, ESPN, the athletic, and there's a ton of attention and just, the general public has been pulled in a lot more too around here. Um, so that's, that's definitely changed. I don't know, you know, how much staying power that has, if they don't win a national championship this year, you know, they fall short in a sweet 16, the elite eight or something, people are going to tune out again pretty quickly that the casual fans will. Um, and football will still be King because there's still spring practice and the spring game. And I guarantee you that, you know, a story from what Nick Saban says after the spring game is going to do more, traffic on our website than a lot of basketball stories will even during March Madness. Uh, that's just the reality of it down here. But in terms of like how they turned it around, you know, the portal, I think played a role. They have a couple portal guys and it, they've gotten some help from there, but NIL wise, I think it's helped too. I, I mean, the key this year has been Brandon Miller and I'm sure Brandon Miller has gotten money, which is fine. That's legal. But I don't think money was really the deciding factor. His dad went to Alabama. His dad played football at Alabama. So you're talking about a legacy with him that really helped them if, above anything else. Like if his dad didn't go to Alabama, I don't know if he's playing here right now. He's probably playing in Kentucky or somewhere. Um, but they've, you know, Nate's system, I think, has proven to be effective wherever he's coached. Um, and that's really taken hold here where I think guys want to play in that system and shoot a lot of threes and play fast and all that. So that plays a role. But I don't know if there's one singular factor because even two years ago, they made it sweet 16 on a number two seed in the tournament. They didn't really have a Brandon Miller. They had Herb Jones, who was an amazing defensive player, but they didn't have that offensive star. Um, and they didn't really, and those were a lot of Avery Johnson's kids too, that were kind of left over. So it wasn't necessarily Nate's recruiting, but they've won different ways. They've kind of built it different ways. And now it's like truly coming together as his team at this point. Um, Mike McDonald. Um, yeah, could I add to that? What? Oh, oh, for sure. I think the job Nate has done is incredible. He went to a place, he was confident enough to go to a football school, right? And let's face it, Alabama is a football school in the heart of football country in the SEC. And, and was confident enough in his ability to build it, was smart enough to be able to piggyback off football. And then everything kind of worked with the NIL. Hey, it's legal for players to be able to make money. Money is made by football down there and they can kind of, you know, piggyback off of that. I think it's great. I think it's hurt a lot of coaches. Ole Miss just fired their coach, Kermit Davis, a good coach, had been there, not a ton of success, right? And they hired Chris Beard, who had been at Texas and had some issues there, right? But Ole Miss is probably looking at like, wait, if Alabama can do this in basketball, why can't we do it? In, in the old days, 10, 20 years ago, Ole Miss would have been like, all right, who cares? You know, with this basketball thing's kind of fun, but we're getting ready for spring football. Now it's like, hey, maybe we got to be a little bit like Alabama in in basketball. And I think Nate has done all that. And you give Nate a ton of credit for what him and his staff have done is, is tremendous. Well, yeah, and that goes right into the question I was going to ask you, Mike, is that I wanted to get your take on – uh Alabama's ascension and mm -hmm. can you go back to the time uh, Mike McDonald I'm asking when he took this job and as you said you know obviously a pretty bold thing to do uh, for all the things you just laid out but knowing Nate 
from your experience with him as a Western New York coach and being around him, the job that was laid that lay ahead and where they are now, what's your general take on your level of whether it be surprise or whether you, did you expect it, not expect it? I, I don't want to put words well, out there. No, I, I mean, you give him a ton of credit. I don't know if expect or not expect, but you give him a ton of credit for him and the staff going down there, figuring out, you know, really you look at the SEC, it was football and then Kentucky is basketball. Kentucky was kind of the backward school, right? Not good in football, always good in basketball. Everybody else was the other way around. And now all of a sudden, you know, Kentucky football has gotten better. That's another story. But they, uh, Al- Alabama said, hey, we're going to commit to basketball. And Nate went in and said, hey, this is what we need. This is what we have to do. They are, they have a lot of money. It is a very popular school. I don't know if you knew that. It's like for people outside of the state from the Northeast, it's one of the most popular schools for kids to go to nowadays, which has helped them. And that was because of the football brand, right? It's become, looks like a great place to be on a, a Saturday afternoon in the fall. And, and Nate has taken that and built upon it with basketball. And I think it's just an incredible job. And I think you give him and his staff total credit for what they built there. And I think it can sustain. Now you get some luck. Mike Rodak just mentioned how, all of a sudden, one of the best players in the country, his parents both went to Alabama, right? Didn't mom and dad both go to Alabama? I think so. Yeah, his mom did too. I think so. And and now all of a sudden, that that kind of worked. You're right, Mike. 20 years ago, that kid's going to Kentucky, right? That kid's going to Duke. That kid's going to North Carolina. But Nate made Alabama a priority for recruiting, and he, he worked it, and he has a way about him that, you know, he's turned into a – a play, a destination where, where it wasn't always that way. Uh, elephant in the room, I guess, pun intended, uh, at Alabama. What has it been like as a journalist before we get into, you know, getting into the basketball aspect of it? And we're going to obviously turn our attention to the bracket, but we can't talk about Alabama and not talk about everything that's been happening um, off the court. What has it been like to cover this? And I guess maybe if you can give a quick thumbnail for those who maybe don't follow it too closely. I mean, the casual fan knows that there's shit going down at Alabama, but might not know exactly the extent of it. As we enter the tournament, what do we need to know about Alabama's off-court situation? Yeah, I mean, it really started in the middle of January because everybody's kind of been talking about it the last couple of weeks, but it really happened January 15th when there was – you know, a lower level bench player is what I would call Darius Miles. He was barely playing, um, had played a lot more last year, but not a key player by any stretch of the imagination who was out late at night with one of his buddies on the bar strip in Tuscaloosa. You know, after midnight, there was a fight with another party that was a boyfriend and his girlfriend um, that ended up with Darius Miles' friend shooting the girlfriend in the face and killing her. Um, and so we found out about that the next afternoon, um, because the police pretty quickly moved on him. Um, he was arrested. He was charged with capital murder within 18 hours of, of the murder itself. Um, and then from there it really was, you know, a big story nationally because there was a, you know, an Alabama player arrested for murder. But at that time we only heard rumblings about Brandon Miller being at the scene, but nothing that we could really report with any sort of you know, responsibility. Um, and that really didn't come until a month later when it was this initial court hearing for miles and, you know, whether he's going to get bond or not. And that's when the details about Brendan Miller came out. Jaden Bradley was there as well. The other Alabama freshman, um, McDonald's all American. And it has become a very tricky situation, a to report on and B just to commentate on in, in this area, because, um, you know, these, the details that came out in court that day w- did not legally implicate Brandon Miller. He's not culpable from any sort of legal standpoint um, because he got a text message from Darius Miles. It's unclear when he exactly received it, if he responded, if he acted upon it specifically, what his intent was. All those are still open questions and probably won't come out until the trial, which by then Brandon Miller is going to be playing in the NBA. Um, but there's nothing legally that Brandon Miller did wrong, which is why he hasn't been charged, which is why Alabama's really stood by him um, because of that. 
but obviously from a judgment standpoint, there's a lot of questions. And that's what's really led to this big national debate. And if you're asking like where, what it's been like for me, I've kind of fallen in the middle of it um, because you have Alabama fans that are passionately defending him. And every time that we have a column written on our website or anything that's, you know, like we, we've been talking to the, the victim's family, um, they've reached out to our columnist multiple times and they're upset with the whole situation with Alabama, but fans don't want to hear that. They want to hear about Brandon Miller, the player, how great this team is, how great he is. They don't think he did anything wrong. So you have both sides that are really digging their heels in. And you have a lot of national columnists, too. Like I said, New York Times, Washington Post was there at the SEC tournament last week. Sports Illustrated, Pat Forty, writing columns about how Alabama didn't handle this right, should have suspended him, et cetera. And then we're just kind of caught in the middle. Um, so it's been contentious, I think, is, is probably the word that comes to mind. Because on Twitter, on email, even just being around the arena, uh, you know, with the SIDs and the staff there, it's there's a lot of um, chilliness uh, from both sides just on, you know, again, you have Alabama wanting to defend their guy. And then you have sort of the national media wanting to hold Alabama accountable. And we're kind of caught in the middle. Mike, what's the dynamic been like covering Nate Oates, who's generally very open and honest and forthcoming with the media? And in this case, maybe he's been at times that's worked against him as saying things that maybe I think the Alabama administration would wish he did not say. And how has that affected your ability to cover the team? Yeah, I mean, it's like you're definitely right, because especially the first couple of years when, like I was saying before, they weren't terribly relevant. He was very accessible. Um always honest you know they, they weren't playing nearly as well a couple of years ago and like he would very be very honest about how their effort wasn't there and how they didn't practice well and it was always great quotes to to write and you could always have a good conversation with him um and that certainly has kind of changed a little bit because he did come out and this all kind of started that day of, of Darius Miles's court hearing and um we were kind of getting details from the courtroom, but in Tuscaloosa with the way it is, there's no laptops allowed. There's no phones allowed. There's no communication devices, no recording devices allowed. And so they're having this hearing basically right before Nate Oates is set to speak in his press conference. And so we're getting a little bit of detail that came out because one of the Tuscaloosa papers had two people there and they had one person leave early to post a quick story. And that's when we first saw Brandon Miller's name come up, but not any of the details about, the text message or any of the stuff that we know now. And so that's when I asked Nate, I said, you know, this just came out in court. How comfortable are you with it? And that's when he said, you know, wrong place, wrong time, kind of gave a kind of brushed it off a little bit in his answer. Um, but then five minutes later is when that courtroom let out. And that's when all the reporters can go back to their phones and their laptops. And all those details got out within, again, five, 10, 15 minutes of Nate, giving the wrong spot at wrong time quote. And so if you believe Alabama, they didn't know any of those details about the text message until then. But then that was kind of juxtaposed against Nate's quote. And that made him look terrible. Um, and again, that's his own doing for saying that. But he said other things about contacting Ray Lewis uh, for advice, um, how he believes Ray Lewis is one of the most mentally tough people he's ever talked to or met. Um, because his, his daughter went to Alabama and, and they've spoken. But now Nate, I think, is definitely being coached up a little bit more by the university. I think they they want him to be a lot more careful with what he says. You can tell that he's more guarded, um, which ultimately is probably going to hurt us down the road if he's less honest or not as good of a, a quote, quite frankly, uh, for what we do. But for for their sake, that's kind of what they want. They, they kind of want the Nick Saban you know, I'm not going to talk to you guys about X, Y, and Z sort of treatment. Mike McDonald, what's it been like for you watching this? This is somebody, you know, a colleague, you know, having spent time together in Western New York. And I, quite frankly, I don't know how close you and, and Nate Oates may have gotten while he was coaching at uh, UB. Um, you know, I'm sure you, you run in some similar circles and camps and things like that, but um, what's it been like for you watching this? Yeah, and, and Nate and I are friend, friendly, but I wouldn't say we're in contact all the time. Uh, you know, it, I think Mike just hit the nail on the head. It's it's 
Uh, first of all, I always said about Nate, Nate never had a filter. You know, when he was coaching UB, he didn't care. He will say what's on his mind. And that's, that's refreshing, you know, for for you guys, I'm sure. You media guys, it, it's great. But I, think- I even had an experience with him as somebody who kind of, you know, does drive-bys because I don't cover college basketball like Jonah does. Um, Nobody but does. I recall having to do a story uh, for the athletic or whatever it would be. And I was just always taken aback, not taken aback. I guess I was always impressed with, like you just said, he was telling me things. He doesn't even know who I am. And he's just like, yeah, whatever. I'll tell you. Um, I thought everybody knew who you were. <laughs> come on. There are two people on this podcast. Don't know who I am. <laughs> I'm sorry. I derailed you there, coach. So, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, it, there's no handbook on how to handle this. And he's going by his gut and trying to do what he can. And I think it's interesting because you have, you know, the other end, you probably have the football coach is, you know, great coach who's probably the most buttoned up guy there is. Mike Rodak would probably tell you where he doesn't, you know, he doesn't give you anything, right? Everything right. is just very similar and they're not going to, everything is, is under he's going to be straight to the point, tell you what he wants to tell you and then get out, um, you know, and, and probably give a message to his team through what he tells you where Nate doesn't care. He's going to tell you what, what he's feeling during that time. So uh, it's probably interesting, not only for the basketball program, but also for the entire institution. Mm-hmm. How much have you seen them play uh, Mike? And uh, I guess as having to deal with, with this, as you follow the headlines of your, whether, however curious you've been while also coaching the Damon Wildcats. But when you watch Alabama play, what's your, what's your take on, on how good they've been while all this is going on? They play, I enjoy watching them play. They play very fast. They're very unselfish. They, um, they have generally every time they play, they have the best player on the floor this year. Would you agree, Mike Rodak? Oh, yeah. First team All-American today from the AP. First time ever an Alabama player has been a first team AP All-American. Is that right? Well, mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, he could be, you know, you could compare him as far as a freshman goes. You go back to maybe Carmelo Anthony in 2003 with uh, Syracuse, 03, 04, whatever that was, right? And say that kind of talent, I think, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's, it's a team that, and they played a really non, a really tough non-conference schedule too. Yeah. And that's always been kind of part of Nate's philosophy where he always says that he wants to play the best teams and they did it last year, last season. They, they beat Gonzaga last season, they beat Baylor. Um, they had some pretty big wins and then they just lost to some bad teams. And of course, yeah. Nate being Nate, he'll say that too. Like, well, we were better than Georgia, but we lost to them. We got more talent than Georgia, but we lost to them. Um, which again, that's great honesty, you know, for him to say that, but this year they schedule tough again, they had Houston on the road, they beat Houston. Um, they played the, the Phil Knight tournament in, in Portland, um, which they drew UConn and Michigan state off the bat. They lost to UConn, beat Michigan state. They happened to play North Carolina, um, because Iowa state went to the championship instead. And at the time, North Carolina was number one in the country. So they beat North Carolina and they beat, they beat Houston, uh, two number one teams within a week or two of each other early in the year. Um, and that really helps. Like you talk about the full body of work the committee's considering, that non-conference schedule was top 10 in terms of um, you know strength of schedule. And you look at a team like Texas A&M that just beat Alabama a week and a half ago in, in College Station, the last game of the regular season, and they're a seven seed in the tournament because A&M did not schedule tough and they lost to some questionable teams in non-conference. So um, that's part of Nate's calling card too, is, is scheduling really tough. And it helps him, you know, in terms of seating and just getting his team ready for the tournament and, you know, have to see how far they can go now. So let's get into the bracket. Uh, Mike McDonald, uh, I, I don't know how in depth you want to get. I know you've uh, been a guest on this show before and we've gone right through the whole freaking thing. Uh, I don't know what your, uh, Whatever you want, you're the boss, you're the point guard. But your level of tolerance is for doing that. But uh, do you look at this bracket 
and see any what did anything jump out at you as being out of line or uh, you know, based on what you've seen or uh, how teams are playing in terms of surging or waning. Uh, and uh, it, most importantly, with your deep, deep knowledge of the Ivy League, uh, what can we say about uh, the Ivy League uh, advancing? Uh, I think it's going to be tough for the Princeton Tigers to advance. So I'm going to tell you right there. I don't know why where the Ivy League came from, but that's good. Um, uh well, your I, son played there, right? He played at Penn. You've he seen a lot Penn. of Ivy League basketball. Yes, I watched the championship game the other day. Princeton and Yale was a, a, a very That's good where game. it's coming from. There you go. And uh that but I think Princeton has a uh, a tough draw and I think it'll be uh it'll be difficult for them. Um but I think the one thing that jumped out to me is that well, the two things. One is the West is very strong. Mm-hmm. Very strong. Kansas, UCLA are both teams I think could be national champions. Um, then you look at Kansas, if they win, they're going to win their first round game, their 116 game, but they could play Arkansas or Illinois. And Arkansas was a team that was picked in the top five in the country in the preseason, has a lot of talent. They've had some injuries, but they're very well coached. And they're a team that could, could clip Kansas. They could get them. Uh, I think, um, I think, do you UCLA, think that's the most vulnerable of the number ones? Um, I think Houston, because they're not healthy, could be vulnerable. Um, uh, Plus, sorry to interject, but Houston ahead. has a tough – they're playing in Birmingham here this week, yes. and they're not happy because their 8-9 matchup in the second round would be Iowa or Auburn. And Auburn's going to have basically a home game against Iowa, and then if they win, Houston's basically going to be playing a road game against Auburn in Birmingham yeah. on Saturday um, if that happens. So. I would agree. Houston's probably the, the number one seed with the, the best chance to lose here. And I don't think they're totally healthy. I think Sasser's hurt. I think that's going to, that's going to keep them. And that could keep them from advancing. I think Kelvin Sampson's done a great job and they really defend. Uh, but I think if they can get out of this and maybe get some rest uh, for Sasser, it gives them a chance to, to move on and get closer to the final four. You know, it's a great storyline. Houston going back, to the final four in Houston, right? It would be, it'd be a really good storyline, but, um, and the, the two seed there is Texas. So you yeah. figure one or two maybe could be going to play in Texas in the, uh, in the final four, but I don't know if either one of them gets out of there. I really don't. I'm just realizing this and I get, is it because of the, uh, the proximity, but uh, how often do two number ones uh, play at the same site? I think it happens. I, I haven't, you know, looked at the exact stats on it, but I mean, it's a very good draw for Birmingham where you have um, both of them there. I, we went to San Diego last year. There was a couple good teams. I forget what their exact seeds were, but. Um, it happens. I've seen it happen before. I don't know if it was a Buffalo game uh, years ago, but it's the opposite of what happened in Buffalo last year. If there are teams local to the host site that are one seeds, they'll be potted together to keep them close. And if they're not, if you don't have one through four seeds in the East, like we did last year, that a region like Buffalo got a lot of, you know, five, 12, four, 13 games. Is See, the Albany, I think, I think the uh, five twelves are better, right? Uh, you yeah. say Mike said the, you know, the ones are there. It's great. In some ways, a lot of times the one sixteen game is a blowout, right? Sure. It should be unless it's, you know, monumental. Um, See Virginia and UNBC or, you know, and then even the eight nine, the eight nine game might be good, but then one eight nine very rarely does that happen too. A lot of times the ones get out of the the first weekend, and so you're not really getting the upsets, the crazy games. And I think sometimes you get those five twelve games. I think it's good. I think if you look at this year's bracket, the other thing that Tim that just jumped out at me is a lot of the twelves, the elevens and twelves are teams that are really good. Mm-hmm. Um, that have been in their conference, uh, or either either they're big big teams like you know big conference teams like an NC State, or they're teams like maybe Utah State or Boise State, who maybe people don't know about, who could win a game or two in this tournament. And I think those those teams could end up, you know, this year they all seem to be grouped around that that level. And I think it was because there weren't a lot of upsets in the conference tournaments. You know, the, the conference tournaments were chalk where and Iona, for example, wins wins the Metro Atlantic or um, 
uh, you know, Kent State won the Mid American, but they were a two seed. But they, it was them or the, uh, them or uh, Toledo were going to get out, and they're always going to be in the that twelve. And I think those it makes for some dangerous twelve seeds. Well, let 11. me ask about Kent State. They're thirteen against yep. Indiana, and just because in a you know Jonah you know really covers the the Mid American and. Uh, from, you know, obviously they come through alumni arena and we pay attention to uh, the teams out of that Mac. Uh, does Kent state have a shot against Indiana? I yeah, think they have a great shot. shot. Bo- both of you, but I, obviously, I mean, Jonah, I, I, I value your opinion on this too. I mean, yeah, I think they do. And I think they, they were a very good Mac team and they played, they lost against Houston. They lost against Gonzaga. They lost against Charleston, but they played, teams that are in the tournament and teams that are similar to like the matchup they might find with Indiana and they were competitive. So I think they absolutely have a shot. I always looking at the bracket. I think it's easier to maybe pick higher seeded teams that you think are going to lose. Like we talked about with Houston than it is to pick the lower seeded team because Kent state's a team that is maybe capable of winning a game in the tournament. But I think a lot depends on the higher seeded team they play against how well that team plays and how the matchup uh, works in their favor or not. And what do we think, since we're talking about the local conferences, uh, for lack of a better thing, what do we think about Iona versus UConn? Um, that is that a Metro Atlantic hosted sub-regional in, in Albany? Yes. Not yeah. that that necessarily matters, yeah. but um, but Iona versus – it could probably not the worst year for Buffalo to not be the, the MAC host because the teams in, in Albany, uh, not sexy – uh, St. Mary's VCU, uh, Miami versus Drake. You have that Kent State versus Indiana. And then uh, I guess the most intriguing to me is Iona and Rick Pitino against UConn. But what, what do we think about that matchup? I think those those games are tremendous because I think a lot of people are picking Miami to lose to Drake, right? That Drake, Drake has been very good this year. Miami was won the regular season in the ACC. Miami is – is very, very talented, and Jim Laranega has a history of winning there. Um, Iona UConn is, you know, it's you know the tournament. The committee doesn't do this, but here's Rick Pitino, widely rumored for the St. John's job, playing a Big East team in the first round game. Surprise, surprise. Uh, I, I think uh, I, I I think UConn's better. I think UConn is pretty good. I think uh, Danny Hurley has done a tremendous job there. And they actually have a guy, Andre Jackson, who's from Albany. Um, and I think we all know, you know, UConn is going to travel well. And that's a short drive from from Connecticut up to Albany. So they're going to have a lot of people there. And I think it's going to be a, a pseudo home game for the Huskies. And I think the Huskies are, are going to be better than Iona. I think, you know, Patino is a great coach. He will have his team ready. They are a good team. And they have even a couple of guys who might be going with him if he does take St. John's or Texas Tech or Georgetown, which he's rumored for. But I think in the end, I think UConn is just better. And they had a tough loss last year in the first round of the NCAAs here in Buffalo to New Mexico State. And I think that's stinging with them a little bit. And I think they will be ready to bounce back. And I think they are a very good team. And uh, we expect them to get out of the Albany Regional. I was going to make that same point. I think them losing last year works in their favor a little bit for getting ready to not be a first-round upset team this year. And I think they're underseeded. This was a team that was number one in the country at one point in the year and beat Alabama by a big number earlier in the season. And I, as much as I think Iona could be a sleeper team, and with Rick Pitino coaching, they, they gave Alabama a semi-tough game a couple of years ago. I don't know if I like this matchup and them winning this game yep. in this way. I would like them better if they were playing somebody maybe from California out west – you know, and and not, I th- I think UConn's going to have a big big advantage in the crowd there uh, this weekend. I think that's going to uh, that's going to factor in. Um, I I think the St. Mary's game with VCU is a tremendous game. St. Mary's is a point guard named Mahaney who's a freshman who's outstanding. If you like point guard play, he's really really good. VCU has guys who really defend. Um, they are not pretty but they defend and they rebound and they play really hard. Kind of like the, the Shaka smart team uh, VCU, they took to the final four. I don't think they're as good, but I think they are. They're the only Atlantic 10 team in the 
NCA or the NIT. Think about that. They, I think there are 15 teams in, in the Atlantic 10, right? And only one team is in the NCA or the NIT, and they're that team. And I think they are very good. And St. Mary's has been, you know, they tied with Gonzaga. Everybody loves Gonzaga. They tied with Gonzaga this year for their uh, for their conference uh, championship. Um, but they got to go across country and play VCU. I think that's going to be a really good game. Uh, Mike McDonald, are there any teams that you going against the chalk that you like or that you could see making a deep run here? Um, I guess, you know, anything beyond, say, the top two or three seeds. Uh, Duke has kind of always been chalk, right? Yeah, um, right. You know, but this year they are they're five seed. I think they were kind of they went through some struggles. They're young. I think they're really talented. And I think John Shire's done a great job coaching them. And they won, they're kind of a sexy pick because they're in the they won the ACC tournament. And people are saying, well, they could be there. I think they're good. I think UConn, Jonah man, mentioned they're they're under underseated and they could be uh they could be better. Is it underseated, Jonah, or overseated? Yeah, I think it could be either one, depending yeah. on your <laughs> how you look at them. But I think I think they're they have a, a chance to be in the sweet 16. Um yeah I like I like the two big East teams that just played for the finals. I and mean, maybe this is East Coast biased. It's Marquette and Xavier. Uh Xavier doesn't defend real well, um, but they can score usually. Marquette is I think one of the best teams to watch in the country if you like offensive basketball. They really share the ball. They're very uh, very unselfish, um, and they shoot it, and they know how to play. Uh, Kulik, their point guard, is uh, was MVP of the Big East, I believe, and he's just uh, really sets guys up and is uh, a, a, really a pass-first point guard, but who can also score a little bit. And I think they they are uh, their team, even though they're a two seed. I think they're a team that that could get out and get to the Final Four. The only person on this podcast who has an alma mater in the tournament uh, is uh, Mike Rodak and his Providence Friars going up against Kentucky. That's an 11 versus a six, right? Yeah. It is. Um, what do we think about that, uh, Mike McDonald? What, what, how is uh, how is Mike Rodak going to be uh, enjoying his uh, uh, his Providence Friars? That's an interesting one. And I really like Providence. And Ed Cooley's a great coach, did a great job. They were here in Buffalo, won two games last year, took Kansas to the wire last year. Um, and I I really think they are good. Kentucky, I have no idea. They, if you had asked me two weeks ago, I'd say, man, they're going to be a Final Four team. If you'd asked me two months ago, I'd be like, they're not going to make the tournament. They are, uh, I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't know what to say about them. Like, I could see Kentucky beating Providence, beating Michigan State or whoever they would play in the next round and get to the Sweet 16 and maybe get in the Elite Eight. And you're saying, oh, the Wildcats are back. I could see them losing again like they did to last year to St. Peter's. And, you know, how do they lose to St. Peter's and then Providence? And then how is this happening? I don't know. I, I, that's my best uh, answer on that one. I, I think I'd probably take Providence. But I wouldn't be surprised if Kentucky wins. How's that for a cop out? <laughs> well, wow. that's an eleven versus a six, so I think that that's a pretty bold prediction. You're 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 leaning towards the eleven seed in that matchup. You know, against a team that is a blue blood. You know, one of the yeah. obviously it's a little bit different, and blue uh, the the blue doesn't bleed like it uh, has in previous seasons, especially in Chapel Hill. Uh, but like but, I said uh, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, Tim. They Kentucky look like, hey, they figured it out. They're good. They're healthy. They're rolling right now. And then they lose to Vanderbilt in the tournament. And it might be just been Vanderbilt was a tough matchup for them. Small, quick guards, almost like St. Peter's, right, last year. Small, quick guards could get by them and kind of nullified their height advantage. And it's kind of like the Providence Friars too, right? Wouldn't you say, Mike Rodak? Yeah, yeah, small, kind of scrappy. Um, I mean, Bryce Hopkins is a good player for them, but they don't have kind of what they had last year to make the same sort of run. I, I wouldn't have the same optimism that they could beat um, 
I mean, Kentucky for number one, but Kansas State in the second round either. Like, I think yep. there's a much tougher road for, for Providence to get to um, a Sweet 16. Plus, you have the Ed Cooley factor where it's pretty out in the open right now that, you know, he's at least considering the Georgetown job um, and how much, you know, his players are affected by that, um, how much just the overall atmosphere of that team is affected by that. And that's hasn't really been put to bed by Ed. I mean, Ed got asked about it yesterday, I think, and said, you know, I'm the head coach of Providence College, which I think every coach in that situation would say, but it wasn't exactly like, I'm never going to go to Georgetown. Um, so in Kentucky, you're right. I, I've watched Kentucky play, obviously, this year. They've been way all over the map. Um, but a team that yeah, I think talent-wise is still far superior to Providence. And um, I would lean towards Kentucky in that one. But I think Kansas State, you know, the, you know, the players they have, I think that's that's a Sweet 16 team out of that that pod. Yeah. And Kansas State struggled a little bit recently, too. They haven't played their best basketball. They kind of peaked mid-year and you don't know. Um, you know, I think, you know, you could be right. It could be lining up for Kentucky to win two games. And now all of a sudden they're out of there and you're saying, oh, man, Big Blue is back. It's true. Um, Mike Rodak, I think, I... Real quick, I think that goes to the 11 sixes. Like, there are a lot of good 11, 10, 11, 12 seeds that are really good that could make a run. And don't be surprised if in, when you get to next weekend in the sweet 16, if there is more than one double digit C still playing. Mike, I know that you're focusing on the crimson tide specifically, uh, and they're the number one seed and probably maybe even some of the Midwest uh, because you have to cover it. Uh, you're still a lo local paper and you have uh uh, Houston versus Northern Kentucky, and then Iowa versus Auburn, which is in a totally different region that uh, Alabama is is in. But have you taken any deep dive uh, into the South region, Mike? Do you have any any thoughts on? I mean, Nate Oates, Alabama's night, survival. Yeah, Oates said last night that he thinks they got a tough draw as number one overall seed, which I think has gotten some people. I got somebody DMing me last night, kind of saying like, "What is he talking about?" Um, you know, it's I, they they definitely get helped out by playing in Birmingham. This is the first time there's been games in Birmingham in 15 years. So you get a home crowd, which I think is the opposite of a tough draw. Uh, you get to play in Louisville, which is the closest region to them. Uh, so that helps in terms of who the rest of the teams are. I mean, Arizona, they just beat UCLA. Um Baylor has kind of been up and down. They they started really slow and they came on strong later. Virginia has been a consistent top 10 team that's had a couple bad losses here and there. So, I mean, you know, those are all potential good games down the road for them. Um, I think Oates is probably more referring to Maryland, West Virginia. And that is the that's what I'm looking at here is the right. toughest uh, opponent that they may face is is in the second round. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, they could get Baylor or Arizona, obviously, if 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 the if the chalk holds up. But you know that that could shake out totally different. There are a lot of teams in there that, I mean, just just to me, looking at the other at the other regions doesn't doesn't have the the gravitas to it. Yeah, I think the general consensus, you know, from watching Sunday night, people thought the South was pretty easy. Um, I know they kind of ran through. On, on the selection show pretty quickly, the top four seeds and kind of where they were in terms of the overall rankings. So Alabama's like average overall ranking for the top four seeds was the second hardest behind the West. But that's, you know, really because of them being the number one overall seed. Um, you know, I, I think it's a very good chance for them to at least make the Sweet 16, um, probably make the Elite Eight. And then if they make the final four, it'll be the first time in school history. But I think that's kind of the expectation. Like, I think anything short of the final four for Alabama and for their fans is going to be a big disappointment, knowing that in three months, Brennan Miller is going to be a top three pick in the NBA draft. And you're starting not from scratch, but you, you're going to have to find uh, some, some scoring next year. And it's not going to be easy to get back to where they were. So this is kind of their shot for the time being. Um, and they kind of want to make the most of it. And if you don't make the final four, I think it's it's going to be a big disappointment. Who who do you think could beat him, Mike? Like early. Early? I I still have trouble seeing Maryland or West Virginia beating them. West Virginia, you think like Bob Huggins, you think kind of push them around a little bit. They have had issues against more physical teams this year. UConn being the the top one that comes to mind. 
after that, I mean, Virginia, but the rest of that pod, San Diego State's played well. I just don't see it. Charleston, you know, was really hot early on. Furman, I, I really don't see any of those eight teams that set those other seven teams in their their bracket right there beating them before the Elite Eight. But, you know, it, I think it would be a Baylor or an Arizona um, later on, you know, to prevent them from getting into the Final Four. I like Furman in the first round. And one thing that I think works in Alabama's favor is this is a region where I think there could be a good amount of upsets early on that make matchups a little easier for Alabama later in the tournament. And one of the other teams in that bracket is the highest Ken Palm rank of all the teams with a double digit seed or higher Utah state with a uh, former coach of Mike McDonald's on the staff. And I think they're a team that could make a little bit of a run, at least win in the first game and, and maybe give an Arizona a tough game in the second round. That's good. That's going to be a fun game. Utah state, Missouri, you mentioned Matt Hart, my former assistants on the staff at Utah state, uh, Buffalo kid played at Canisius high school and he, uh, he's a, you know, they have a, they can really score. That game's going to be first one to a hundred wins. Missouri really goes up and down scores too. Um, I think Creighton is in that, you know, in that yep. bracket. Um, they're, they can really score. I don't know how well they defend, but they, they're good. Uh, I think Virginia might be able to beat Alabama, but I'm, I'm like you, Mike, I don't see, I don't see Alabama lose. I think you're going to look at Alabama, Arizona mm -hmm. uh, with two teams that really haven't been to the final four in a long time or ever uh, with the chance to go. And I think that's where you, it's chalk, but I think that's kind of where it would be in that region. Yeah. It, this has been a great uh, and educational for me uh, overview of what's going on with college basketball right now. Um, oh, I was just going to ask if you guys had any general thoughts, but let's not leave out the, the first four. Uh, games what do we uh, i i think arizona state nevada could be a lot of fun i mean all these games can be because they're set up to be uh but arizona state nevada um and uh and the coaches there too are are pretty entertaining <laughs> two good guards right there yeah they, they they were okay so i look at fairly dickinson fairly dickinson's coached by a guy tobin anderson they were in a he was in our conference the last few years, St. Thomas Aquinas, and he took three of his players with him, and they ended up winning 18 games this year, 19 games, whatever they won, and they they uh, won their league, even though they finished second in their league to Merrimack because Merrimack uh, is not eligible yet. They have a four-year wait period, so it's kind of a bizarre thing. They finished the second, but they got to be first, and they get to go to the NCAAs, and they're, they're playing a team that's under 500, and I think they're an underdog to a team that's under 500. And I think they're going to win that game. Uh, so watch Fairleigh Dickinson get out, and then, then they got to play uh, uh, Purdue. So that'll be a problem. Mike, you got any sleepers in the NJCAA Division II bracket? Well, you got to go with Billy Beeline, right? But yeah. not a sleeper, the number two seed. Yeah, I know. But they gotta, then I got to go chalk then. That's my guy. You know that. Yeah. So he's going to uh, – uh, I'm sure he's hopefully going to win the whole thing. I think he's got a good chance. I got a really good team. Mike McDonald, are we leaving anything out? I know we went all over the place, uh, but uh, as we usually do. That's yeah, good. and it's what I en I enjoy it. I love having you on. We get to talk about this. Uh, I want to say I think the last time you were on the show when we were on terrestrial radio and you came into the studio with Mike Morano as your bodyguard um, <laughs> wasn't. Wasn't OJ Simpson on that show? That might have been. Oh, we had the uh, bodyguard. <laughs> Thanks, Bracket picks from OJ. I, I probably could get him on the line. Hey, if Nate Oates can get advice from uh from Ray Lewis, uh, maybe we can get some picks from OJ Simpson. Um, Mike McDonald, thank you for this. Thanks, Mike Tim. Rodak, thank you for this. You're welcome. Jonah Bronstein, as always, a pleasure. And uh, thanks well, to everybody out there for listening. Oh, I guess I should say, you know, the Bills are going through free agency right now. Really not a lot going on. Um, some restructures and things like that. I want to keep this just to March Madness. We're going to have another podcast on Friday. Scheduled guest, uh, Ricky Cobb. Now the name, Ricky Cobb, does that ring a bell? It should because he is the guy behind the Super 70s Twitter account uh, who is turning into a... Uh, enterprise in and of himself uh he has turned uh pop culture uh from my youth anyway in, into uh a business 
and he's doing incredibly well. My, Mike McDonald, do you follow that Twitter account? He's a big white shadow fan. I know that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, we got, so uh, Chris Baker and I, uh, at Sabres Prospects on Twitter, uh, had a couple of beers at Elmo's on Friday, and we came up with a bunch of either ors that we're going to ask Ricky Cobb. You know, we're going to ask, say, uh, the Gran Torino or the General Lee. Uh uh, not Marianne or Ginger, because that that's a conversation that's been had, but Janet or Chrissy, you know, um, I, I thought that, uh, Jonah maybe, has no idea what you're talking about. You what, know, that. Um, yeah, what, I'm thinking about what else I got going on Friday. And maybe I can what get back Buffalo, um, uh, what Buffalo player would you have take your last shot? You know, would it be McAdoo, Randy Smith? You know, he'll know all this stuff. Oh, Jake. No, I'm, well, Miles, right? Darius Miles, perhaps. Dominic Welch. My I don't know that he's going to know Dominic Welch or Joe Licata for that matter. Um, Mike McDonald, thank you for this. Thanks, and uh, once again, uh, to Mike Rodak for joining us. It's a long time in, in the making. Uh, we tried to get you on before the combine, and it's uh, probably even better that we got to, to have this talk as Alabama enters uh, the tournament as the number one seed and the favorite to win it all. Uh, and thank you out there for listening to Tim Graham and friends brought to you by CTBK CPAs and business consultants. CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach that takes on each new challenge with collaborative problem solving skills to provide creative solutions for their clients. Based right here in Western New York, CTBK is a champion for your business and our community. Additionally, CTBK goes beyond tax and attest services by offering a wide array of consulting and outsourced solutions tailored to meet the unique needs of your business, allowing you to focus on your operational and long-term strategic goals. Whether you're a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, the team at CTBK is determined to help you succeed. Visit ctbk.com or call 716-630-2400. 716-630-2400. To learn how CTBK's one-team approach can work for you.